All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Chalk Talk. I'm Adam Petrus. And I'm Hale Henches. There he is. Hale Henches, the great Alabama tight end, two-time national champ, more than a cup of coffee in the NFL. And um, today we have an awesome guest. We have an excellent guest that's going to give us some insight into the NFL. Specifically, we're going to be talking about them Cowboys for a little bit. But uh, really, we're going to talk uh, with RJ Ochoa, um, based out of Texas. Uh, he is the producer at Blogging at the Boy with Blogging the Boys. Um, and he's a Dallas Cowboys fan community. And uh, he just got back to, from the Super Bowl. And certainly, RJ and I just missed out on seeing each other. Uh, although he was pulling in some very early hours there on Radio Row in Las Vegas. Uh, but, Hale, the Super Bowl 58 is in the books. And um, tell me, did you have a prop bet that we were going to see overtime? No, no, I don't I don't think we did. And just, you know, when you look back at Super Bowls, I think the last one was the Patriots and the Falcons with that stunning comeback by Tom Brady. And, you know, you just you never think that's going to be the the outcome of the game. But, you know, I, I certainly wasn't upset free football. I mean, that that's certainly a great thing. And uh, what a great game it was. I would love to see the back and forth. I mean, great quarterback battles, great defense. I really had everything that you could want as a fan. Absolutely agree. And with that, let's bring in RJ Ochoa. Straight coming to us from South Texas. RJ, thanks for being on the show today. Of course, Adam Hale. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a bummer the football season's over. Um, pitchers and catchers report, and I guess that that's cool. But um, you know, it's whatever it is. Like 190 days until the NFL's back on our lives, so the countdown has officially begun. It has indeed, and uh, man, that clock just started. But you know, coming off the heels of Super Bowl 58, you know, RJ, we talked about it, um, and certainly you've got quite the uh, the background in covering them Cowboys um, from from video producing and blogging, uh, writer, um, I believe, across uh, SB Nation. Um, you know, do tell us um, some of your immediate thoughts about the outcome of Super 58. What's the storyline coming out of Super Bowl? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm past the point as a Cowboys fan of caring whether or not the 49ers win a sixth world title that used to be, you know, um, in Super Bowl 47, that was something I felt really passionately about. And I don't know if I've just become numb to it all, but, um, you know, it is cool to see the Chiefs obviously cement themselves as a dynasty. And I think we're all just kind of basking in in the greatness that they are and, and the wonderful story that they are. And they have so many fun characters. And obviously the Taylor Swift of it all added to the story this particular season. It was strange in that the game was kind of slow. And, and I think that allowed for all of us to kind of wait to figure out exactly how we wanted to feel. And the fourth quarter just felt so stressful. And I feel like the the net result or net narrative out of everything is that the Chiefs are the modern day dynasty. They're the first, obviously, you know, dynasty to exist since the Patriots, first team to go back to back since the Patriots. And the 49ers are, you know, really kind of the dynasty that never was, right? You know, pick the one you want, the 90s Bills, um, 70s Vikings. Uh, if you want to go different sport, I mean, they're the 90s Utah Jazz. It is just, you know, if there were a handful of moments that they could change over the course of the last few years, I mean, we might be talking about them in the same sort of way. And so, that's the peril of sports. That's the magic and the beauty and the heartbreak of it all. Absolutely. No, I love what you said there. And, you know, I, I felt watching it that there was not a moment in the second half where I felt like the Chiefs weren't going to win. You know what I mean? It was one of those things where, I like, I felt like the 49ers just had to hang on as long as they can. And, and you know, right, from being around the game, certainly from playing the game, it's it, it's a moment of, you know, hey, we don't ever want to be in a position where we feel like we're just trying not to lose. And it, it seemed like a little bit during the, the second half, the 49ers went away from that attack, that ground and pound with McCaffrey, spreading the ball out well, to now it's, all right, let's just try and hold on and win this game. And, you know, when you have someone like Mahomes and Kelsey on the other end, it's, you know, that's that's not a very good bet. So that was certainly something I felt like that narrative was starting to catch traction as we got deeper into, you know, the third quarter, the fourth quarter. And then it was, you know, Mahomes, two different winning drive, game winning drives. I mean, you know, it's tough to bet against them. Yeah, I think, I think even, you know, there was the the weird pitch back to Isaiah Pacheco to yeah. start the second half, and you just kind of felt like, man, are they, you know, too tight? And then there was the interception. But to your point, Hale, it didn't, you know, when he threw that interception, I don't, I don't know that anybody was like, oh, this is game over. Like, it just, it yeah. felt so inevitable. And that, 
they have three world championships and and then all of them have come back from 10 point deficits is just absurd um you know that, that anybody could could pull that off and make it look as easy as they managed to even if it did take overtime in this particular instance I think, you know, you can sum it up to what Patrick Mahomes said on the podium there that, um, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs are never underdogs. You are never going to rule them out. And, you know, what's funny is um, I will tell you, I wanted to see San Francisco win, right? A couple reasons, um, but irrelevant, except for the fact, though, when I'm watching this football game, I've seen this before. And I've been to a handful of Super Bowls. I've been on the sidelines of the Super Bowl with Zebra supporting the Next Gen Stats program. And so it, it's neat to see that perspective, to be on the sidelines. Uh, I was behind Kansas City when they played San Francisco uh, two Super Bowls back, uh, and then or three Super Bowls back. And then um, also when uh, behind the bench of the Patriots to see, a, to see a win. It is a neat dynamic to see it from that level. But when you see Kyle Shanahan with a lead in the Super Bowl, and then you've got Patrick Mahomes, the guy finds a way to win. Uh, and he did that again here with his, with his arm, with his legs. Being an executive at the helm of quarterback, um, I'm with you all. I mean, no matter what happened, Kansas City was going to find a way to win this game, and uh, they found it in overtime. It was incredible, um, and I feel for Kyle Shanahan on a human level just because that's such a, a difficult reality to reckon with that, you know, he's blown three different 10-point leads, and, and circumstances have changed, venues have changed, teams have changed, his, his position in those games has changed, um, and that's – it. it it's such a self-fulfilling prophecy, or at least it feels that way at this point in time. And, you know, if you're Kyle Shanahan, you have a 10-point lead in a, in a playoff game in the future, how, how can anyone feel safe? I mean, you know, and that sounds silly and it sounds ridiculous, but um, the the wild nature of sports, you know, suggests – I mean, it wasn't obviously until the NFC title game that they hadn't come back from a deficit. And and it's not until you do those things that, that people start to believe. And so, um, you know, we like to, as Cowboys fans, um, often remind 49ers fans that their Super Bowl drought is longer, albeit just barely. Um, and so, um, you know, it's when, when you're in that place, everything feels dark until there's a glimmer of hope and a glimmer of light. And for, for now, the 49ers are just kind of entrenched in darkness. That's well said. Yeah, no, I mean, I love what you said there, too. And, you know, let's let's rewind just a little bit from the journey to the Super Bowl to let's pivot to the Cowboys, since you mentioned them. You know, talk a little bit about just what, what what happened with that Green Bay game. You know, talk about what went right, what went wrong, you know, where maybe you, you would have liked to see some different changes with the offense or the defense. Can you just maybe give your perspective on what you shared with your listeners? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much went right, uh, to be fair, <laughs> but it was yeah. it was really stunning, to be honest. It was it was almost so overwhelming that you never really processed um, what I think is an example 49ers fans are feeling today, and not just because they lost the Super Bowl, but because it's such a death by a thousand paper cuts kind of thing. For the Cowboys, it was just this immediacy. It, it was just they were immediately down big. It was you know down seven and then down 14 after the um, Jair Alexander interception, and everything that happened was the most sort of, of course thing. And, you know, I've, I've done a lot of water carrying, I think in my day and tried to, you know, disprove a lot of, you know, silly narratives. And, and you all have been very helpful in that capacity by providing some, some objective data and some objective evidence, but that game just sort of tugged and, and, and picked at every wound and scar that had ever healed about the Cowboys. Oh, Dak Prescott can't get it done in the big games. And he has this, you know, MVP sort of caliber season and obviously has a, a terrible outing. And Mike McCarthy, uh, you know, can't get, you know, his team prepared for a big time moment. He, had done all of these things that, that the Cowboys hadn't done in forever. I mean, I, I don't know how well aware you all are, but uh, the Cowboys went to the playoffs three straight years in a row. That hadn't happened since the mid-90s. They won double-digit games three years in a row. That hadn't happened since the mid-90s. They obviously had all sorts of, you know, pick the record you want. I mean, Deron Bland with the pick-six record and, and all these other, you know, crazy, impossible things that they were accomplishing. And they pulled off the NFC East, even though Philadelphia had that massive lead right at the beginning of December. And they hadn't lost a game at home. And I, I know that I'm just just going kind of long-winded here, but they felt invincible. It felt like, okay, at the very least, they're going to break the NFC title game appearance drought, and and they might lose to San Francisco because that's what everybody except for Kansas City does, uh, but it will feel like progress. And so to just get punched in the mouth and be down 27 to nothing – you know, people say like, oh, I'd rather my team get blown out than lose a heartbreaker. You would not rather do that. I mean, because we, we just had to kind of sit in it and, and just reckon with that reality for an entire half of football. And 
you know, I, I don't, I still don't have a great explanation other than it was just the worst possible day they could have had. And that green Bay obviously had one of their best days. And um, I think as far as the fundamental football of it all, you know, Dan Quinn has, has been so great for the Cowboys and I'm anxious to see how he'll, he'll fare in Washington. But I mean, we talk about how nickel is the new base and all sorts of things like that. Dan Quinn hates linebackers. I mean, the Cowboys have had one true right. classic off ball linebacker on their team, you know, in the last whatever two years. And it's been Leighton Vander Esch, who isn't necessarily a, a reliable player from a health standpoint, unfortunately. And so, you know, Marquise Bell's a, a converted safety, even DeMarvio and Overshown, who, who the Cowboys were high on, is a converted safety in terms of his collegiate days. And they were just too small uh, for what the Packers wanted to do in, in, you know, out of 12 personnel. And they were just getting pushed around. And, and it didn't help that the offense couldn't go shot for shot with them. And I think it was, um, in, I'd say in, in the drought that the Cowboys are in, probably the most devastating playoff loss they've had. It's not worse than the, the catch or the 94 title game or things like that, but uh, because of the expectation, because it, it finally felt like they were vanquishing all these demons from their, their past and skeletons in the closet, uh, to just have no chance at any point was really demoralizing. Yeah, that game hurt. That hurt for the Cowboy Nation. I think that hurt for anybody who wanted to see a good game in the playoffs, but certainly – you know, you're absolutely right that what the, the Cowboys achieved this season, let alone going into the playoffs, you expected them to be dominant, to put up a, a serious fight. And to your point, they got punched in the face and they were never able to get back up. And so out of all of that, and of course, you know, you watch Jerry Jones in the box during the game. You watch what, you know, Mike McCarthy. Um, give us your thoughts. What, what's, in the, what's in the head of Jerry Jones? And then separately, what do the fans think about Jerry Jones these days, you know, from the faithful and or the base of the Cowboys. And then, you know, what should we expect out of Mike McCarthy in the next year? I think that that Jerry wears on people. If you're a Cowboys fan, I think that a lot of non-Cowboys fans view him as this kind of character of the NFL. And I, I do think he has a place in NFL history. I think he has a rightful place in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I mean, the NFL has a, a market in Los Angeles now and, and Las Vegas. And I don't know that the, either of those things happen if not for him. And so he has certainly grown the game as a um, kind of ambassador for the league. And, and what he's done for the Cowboys, I mean, they're the most, you know, I, I would imagine a big reason why I'm here is because people have a level of interest in the Cowboys and, and I'm connected to them. They help me put food on my table and support my family. And so I'm certainly gracious or grateful for that. But um, I think people generally nowadays meet anything he says with with rolling of the eyes um at least anybody maybe south of the age of you know 45 anybody who who probably hadn't hit puberty you know by the time the the 90s dynasty was was all said and done and it's it's because it just kind of feels like more of the same i mean at our current moment in time just literally uh jerry said in the lead up to the senior bowl that the cowboys were going to go all in um on the 2024 season and that sounds great and that sounds awesome and you know i'm personally grateful for that like i said because you know we can have a lot of fun with that but in the you know they still haven't hired a defensive coordinator and there's all this mess about whether it's going to be mike zimmer or rex ryan and those aren't moves you know necessarily that i i would endorse personally not not that i know more than they do but um so i think people feel like they're a circus and, and and fans feel like all they care about is money and they certainly have a lot of it um they have more of it than anybody else and um and the mccarthy of it all you know, I really did defend Mike, and I, I feel like his, his greatest crime might be that he, he lost a, a really public PR battle to Aaron Rodgers, and that really shaped a lot of people's opinions of him. And um, I think that people, you know, feel like any success he ever had in Green Bay was completely and totally Aaron Rodgers and, and that he's just this doofus who's responsible for nothing. And and I mentioned, I mean, has, has he won the Super Bowl with the Cowboys? No, but he did he did things that nobody has done in the drought and he accomplished all sorts of great things. And I do believe that he instituted a higher level of football culture than had existed and that had been allowed to exist within the, you know, corporation that is the Dallas Cowboys. A lot of people liken them to, um, to the Roy family. I don't know if y'all are succession fans, but it, it kind of feels yeah. like that's who they are sometimes. And so I, I think that Mike deserved a lot of credit and I always st stood up for him, but you know, people would ask me a year ago leading up to the 2023 season, well, you know, if they don't reach the NFC title game, do you fire him? And, and my response was always like, well, well, how would they, how do they miss it? Like, do they miss it off of a, off of a last second, you know, field goal that hits, they miss it because they get waxed in the playoffs, you know, next matters. And I think that what we saw was, was, you know, one of maybe a handful of ways this could have gone to, to justify moving on from him. Um, particularly when you consider that they have to make a decision about Dak Prescott, if they want to extend him. And so, 
I, I'm not a fan of going at this with Mike McCarthy in a contract year. I think that that creates this weird sense of awkwardness that is difficult to overcome. And if they do extend Dak, now you've got your head coach and your quarterback on, on different timelines, which, you know, creates awkwardness for, you know, any sort of potential future head coach. Um, so I, I, I think you had to make a dramatic decision one way or another. I'm not endorsing extending Mike McCarthy, but I think you either had to do that or move on from him and reset now because you're kind of hokey poking this thing and half in and half out. And, and that's going to ultimately rear itself over the course of the 2024 season. I'm afraid. I love what you said there. And, you know, RJ, I think there is a, an incredible amount of truth to the couple different points that you just made there. And I've always been a big proponent too of giving coaches and players the time that they need to develop and the time that they need to, you know, prove that they can be really, really good in this league. And, you know, obviously it, this is the NFL, right? This isn't high school or peewee football where, you know, it's like, well, they're still grown and maturing and all those things, right? Like, obviously these are grown men who are doing, you know, things that they have to do and they need to produce. Totally get that. But I've always been the, of the mind of, hey, if someone shows promise, like that, right? MVP caliber uh, season this year. Mike McCarthy, fantastic stuff done this year, right? I've always been a proponent of give these guys the chance. Give them one more draft. Give them one more free agency. Give Dak a couple more tools. Um, but that's how I see it, right? As a former player, I've always been a little bit more like, well, you know, a bird in the hand's worth two in the bush, if you know what I mean. So it, it does get a little bit a little bit tough there. And I see where you're coming from. And I'm sure that was a very polarizing thing for the Cowboys nation, whether or not to keep him, what to do, you know, who to go get. It, it's, it's, it's never a black and white answer by any means, but I'm, I'm happy that he's staying around. Um, and, you know, hopefully that they're going to continue to build and, and, you know, make it further in the playoffs this season. They just got to get over that hump though. Yeah. And he's, you know, done a great job. I think of surviving the, attention that comes with being the Dallas right. Cowboys head coach. And I'm certain you both remember the Sean Payton rumors that were just never ending, um, obviously. Oh, yeah. And and I think we would all anticipate things being similar with Mike Vrabel and Bill Belichick, you know, kind of just waiting in the wind um, throughout the course of this upcoming season. And so I, I certainly think he deserves a lot of credit. But and for the first time ever, I, I have felt um, in, in the you know brief month long offseason that it's been so far for the Cowboys that, that they are fighting the history. I mean, this is a obviously a, a Tiffany brand franchise in the NFL. It's the most valuable sports franchise in the world. And, you know, it is an incredibly heavy shadow that looms over them. It's the only one that, that looms over the building because they won't put the curtains up for, you know, uh, for afternoon games and you get that awful glare that every player hates. But um, it's it's so hard. I, I mean, it's, it's just very difficult. And I, I think now more than ever, they really kind of feel the weight of – fans and, and their kind of dissatisfaction. I mean, you've got people who, you know, have, have grown up and live life and have children and have second mortgages and all sorts of things that, you know, have been waiting for this to end. It's, you know, we, we've reached a point of a statistical Im improbability that it would last this long. I mean, I've tried to contextualize it a lot of different ways. I think my favorite one nowadays is um, the last time the Cowboys, you know, even appeared in an NFC championship game, Marvin Harrison senior was in, in college. And, um, and so he's, you know, obviously done a lot of things and, um, his son will be in the NFL before, uh, before the Cowboys make it back to the title game at the very least. Well, I gotta say, I was born and raised in Cleveland, worked for the Cleveland Browns. Um, I feel some pain there as a Browns fan, as a Cleveland Indians fan, as a Cavaliers fan. Um, it's it, there's a long drought. And um, certainly, you know what? I loved what Detroit did this year. Um, certainly that game against the Cowboys was was pretty phenomenal. Um, questionable aspects about some of the, 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 the referee and the two-point conversion and what is, what is a sign, what is a call uh, of designation. But um, as you know, you know, Zebra is the official partner of the NFL for Next Gen Stats for the player and ball tracking. Uh, we also do some things for NFL health and players' safety. Certainly, um, the evolution of the game, we're only seeing the players get faster, you know, bigger, tougher. Um, but, you know, curious from your standpoint, when you digest all the data that's out there, um, are you able to uh, take away some, some notable aspects from what is delivered out of the NFL's Next Gen Stats program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a big fraud without you all, if I'm being completely and totally honest. Um, 
you know, your newsletter points me in, in the right direction, I would say. More than that, um, kind of holds my hand. Obviously, the first thing I do is, is kind of scan for, for anything Dallas Cowboys related, which is, is never fun after um, a loss, you know, particularly after they get blown out when they got beat by the 49ers. As an example, you guys just had all this information about how wonderful George Kittle was and uh, all sorts of stuff. But um, it's so difficult to process things like that in real time and to appreciate things like that in real time. Um, and we live in an era in a day and age where there's, I wouldn't say too much information, but there's too much for a standard human being to comprehend in a moment. And so you do need time, um, you know, at the very least to absorb this and, and to contextualize what's happening. You brought up the Detroit game. CD lamb had the, I think it was 91 yard touchdown in that game. Um, you all had some really valuable information on that. And, in the moment you feel it and you see it and it feels incredible, but then, you know, then, then the end of the game happens and it just kind of flies away because there's this controversy and et cetera, et cetera. And it was on a Saturday night. So, you know, particularly everyone's talking about just the controversy on Sunday morning, but then the dust settles and you're able to kind of remember and say, man, he had this massive touchdown. This was a big deal. And that was also the night that CD set the Dallas Cowboys franchise record uh, for single season receiving yardage. And it was the night Jimmy Johnson went into the ring of honor. So uh, it's, as you can see, there's a lot of things that kind of smushed that down as the evening went along. And so I certainly, you know, it, what y'all do is among my most coveted resources and, and points of information and, and points of data, because without it, I, I wouldn't be able to discern everything that's happening. I'm very fortunate that the Cowboys generally play in isolated windows and island games to where I'm able to watch a lot of the NFL. Uh, but, you know, there's the occasional week or two throughout the season where they play at noon. And when that happens, you just miss everything. And so um, I'm always anxious, whether it's with regards to my own personal fantasy team or, you know, whoever the Cowboys are playing the week ahead or the week after. Um, fascinated to, to kind of just cross-reference and be pointed in new directions by what you all offer. Um, to help me kind of shape the way I think. And so I'm, I'm incredibly appreciative of you all. And that's why I was so excited when you all asked me to do this, because what you do helps me more than almost anything that I have in terms of being able to do what I do. That's awesome. Uh, that's fantastic. No, we appreciate that. And look, um, from, from the operators that are in the venue that collect that data, you know, who show up at 7 a.m. for a one o'clock kick to make sure that we're tracking every player of every single play to include the balls and the officials, um, they do a tremendous job. And then, of course, how that newsletter is put together and, and the, the reviews and the, the follow ups. We have a great team. And uh, but we want to empower guys like you to be able to tell that story and, and, and highlight the performers and or uh, and what we've seen in the in the world of you know, player performance and teams taking in the data. Uh, is that there are there are nuggets that certain teams can pull out and they can build their schema against based off performance data. So it's really neat to have seen how, you know, how hungry the teams and the clubs and we as fans are uh, for the data itself. Yeah, I mean, it's um, I almost just wish it would happen in real time for me, but it's it's all it's such great information and such valuable information that I feel like I would get lost in the moment. And so that's why it's so valuable to have afterwards and because it does allow you to, to, to really put in perspective i think again with regards to cd in this particular game um just how dominant of a performance it was because you know i think the standard football fan looks at it and, and maybe they do have a piece of cd in some sort of you know game whether it's fantasy or whatever the case may be and they say oh he had a million yards and he had all these catches and cool he set a, a cowboys franchise record yeah but but like how is like how is he faring relative to the field? And and those those conversations are really helpful. What I know CD didn't win offensive player of the year, and I know that Tyree Kill didn't either. But there was that debate brewing, you know, at that time in the season, whether or not CD was was truly kind of entering a space that was, you know, above and beyond even Tyreek. And so that information, things like again, and, and you all I would say have such a great feel. Um, there, there's a talent there besides just collecting the data, but but feeling out what is valuable and what makes sense. And and you also have a great ability and skill to reference it to historical points that that are important. And again, all, that always just kind of serve at least the itch that I'm trying to scratch. Um, so it's helpful to kind of contextualize, man, his completion percentage over expectation. That is a whole different, you know, level of discussion than how many yards that he have. I mean, you know, it's a it's a completely different thing to consider. Uh, on that deep pass that Dak had to him, how far Dak had to travel, how quickly he was running, what his miles per hour were. Um, and that allows you to appreciate what seems like a great player, seems like an average play, and, and understand, actually, this was a tight window throw that you know had an incredibly low probability of being completed, but somehow Dak found Michael Gallup for the touchdown nonetheless.
less. Um, and so, you know, the Cowboys might cut Michael Gallup this offseason. And, and Michael Gallup's kind of a pro at pulling off, you know, receptions like that is one example. And so that helps me understand, okay, if they're moving on from Michael Gallup, they're going to miss somebody who's capable of pulling off these, you know, for lack of a better word, clutch receptions. And so I would not have the ability to, to think that way if it weren't for you all. Appreciate that. Fantastic. Yeah, we really appreciate that. And I love what you said because you know, as, a, as a former player, there's a lot of goodness behind being able to say, okay, you know, CD Lamb is open, right? Maybe he has one stride on, but to be able to say, like, on average, he's getting two yards of separation at the right. top of the route. I mean, that's for, for a fan's perspective or for someone like CD Lamb to be able to see that, that and be like, okay, you know, I'm really. I'm really in my 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 era here where I'm I'm really playing extremely well. And then you know that validates the fact that he's in that Tyreek Hill conversation because Tyreek Hill's getting a lot of separation at the top of the route because of the nature of the routes that he runs. And so that uh definitely validates that. So we appreciate you saying all those things and uh it's it's good to see that it's being utilized. I would just offer as a rebuttal there or as just a compliment to that. Um and again, that's where I think you all do have such a great feel is you'll say things like that. And, you know, I think if I told my dad, he might be like, oh, that's cool. Like, doesn't everybody generate two yards of separation? You know, like the, the context behind how how big that is or how wide that is relative to the field or relative to anybody else or relative to however anybody else played that specific week. Um, that is really helpful because you can, you know, the NFL does such a wonderful job, obviously, and I'm, I'm not here to, to criticize the man or the machine, but, you know, they do things like FedEx Air Player of the Week and FedEx Ground Player of the Week. And th sometimes, you know, you it doesn't pass your kind of field test for who played well or who didn't. And so yeah. um, this this helps you either justify that or helps you in your argument of, well, hey, you know what, maybe maybe this player deserved it a little bit more, whatever the case may be. Um, so so again, I, I seriously cannot thank you all enough um, for the hard work, because I, I know that that is not easy, um, you know, in any way, shape or form. No, there's a lot of data to pull through. And so I got to give a shout out to Don Russo, Tim Klein, who work on that newsletter. They do an awesome job week in and week out. And um, I'm sure we're going to get an email here uh, later this week with the, uh, the Super Bowl readout. But um, RJ, let's move into the lightning round here. Just on a couple um, items uh, around football, around the Super Bowl. Um, but let's start with uh, your personal greatest of all time Dallas Cowboy football player. You know, I mean, if I had to if I was charged with like building a museum, I think I'd say Roger Staubach. I think he, you know, kind of exemplifies everything that the Dallas Cowboys represent, um, both on and off the field, obviously. Um, but, sure. but if I had to go off of just kind of personal, you know, experiences, I'm 34 years old and um, I'd probably say Tony Romo just because he, you know, he was the quarterback of my favorite team um, at a lot of formative points in my life. And, and you remember that, um, you know, you remember, I remember when they lost to the giants in the divisional round, that was my senior year of high school. Um, not that that was a good memory, but, um, you know, I remember just being so I didn't go to school the next day. I was just I couldn't handle it. And he was you know, he was the quarterback of my favorite team when I went to wow. college, he was, you know, and 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 all these kind of, you know, I, I think as football fans, we we measure and this is certainly true for you all, I would imagine, from based on your personal experiences. But we measure life achievements or, or life landmarks through the prism of football. And, oh, this happened the year that, you know, the you know, the 20 to three comeback happened or whatever, things like that. And so um, having that that bedrock common denominator for for a lot of formative years of my life, like I mentioned, uh, makes him just a little bit more special than a lot of players um, in, in my own personal experience. Absolutely. No, I, we really appreciate that comment. And, you know, I think it's it's a big testament too to Tony Romo as a commentator as well, because he's he's by far my favorite commentator out there and i'm not just saying that because i live in texas i mean really truly i think he opens up the game like few can and i'm excited to see people like tom brady when they get into that sphere as well continue to add to that you know former player knowledge pool because it's just it's, it's so helpful to, to bridge that gap between player to commentator to fan i mean i think it, it increases everyone's knowledge of the game so great quarterback maybe even better commentator yeah, um, he's obviously got a whole new audience in that sense that, that kind of forgets that he was the quarterback. I mean, Dak Prescott is the longest tenured starting quarterback in the NFL, and it all began when his uh, his broadcasting career began. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, he, he and Jim Nance do an excellent job together. Yes. And um, my, my wife tends to say Jim Nance has that very smooth, glowing voice, and then Romo comes in, and uh, but he's that kind of like he, – he gives you the straight talk. But he does a really nice job of explaining. And so I, I agree, Hale. I've been right there with you. I think he does a fantastic job. Um, RJ, we go back to the Super Bowl. Let's take the halftime show. Uh, give me a rating for Usher, 1 to 10. 10 being just the best show you've ever seen for a Super Bowl halftime. 
I mentioned my age, um, so I don't think it's difficult to backtrack and, and kind of figure out that I was I was in middle school, kind of when a lot of these songs were, um, you know, were, were heavy. Um, so it was great. It, it felt like the first halftime show I'd ever experienced that way. That felt like a throwback to my, you know, I wouldn't call that my youth, but um, but some some more adolescent days. Um, so in that sense, it was, you know, eight out of 10, nine out of 10. I've never been big on the Prince halftime show. I know that's a lot of people's go to um, Bruno, I thought, had the best one of all time. He's such a showman. Uh, oh, Beyonce really? was great. Uh, the boss was great. I mean, Prince was great. Don't get me wrong, which is not my personal favorite, but it is so difficult to sing and dance like that. And, and you inject, you know, roller skates into the equation. So to pull it off in general was a really impressive sort of feat of athleticism. Maybe I feel like you guys should track Usher because that was, um, you know, there was a lot going on there. I would be curious to kind of see the data. Yeah. yeah. Going back to prop bets. I don't know if there was one for Usher to be on roller skates, um, That's true. but he can move pretty well on the skates, but I'm not surprised because the way the guy moves, you know, with no um, skates on, he is pretty smooth. So uh, appreciate that. Yeah, for um, sure. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, RJ, give us your thoughts on who you think would be a an early favorite to be in the Super Bowl next year. If you had to pick two teams, what are your thoughts nowadays? And obviously, if it's if it is the Cowboys, I'm happy. If it's not, you know, I don't think anyone will hold it again. Just your unfiltered thoughts here. I think my non-Chiefs thoughts, because I do think you you have to kind of add that yeah. that lens now, just because of who they are. Um, it just feels, you know, Buffalo feels like the Dallas of the AFC, obviously, situation, and and Josh Allen's just so talented. Um, you know, I, I believe in them slightly more than I do Baltimore at this point in time. I'm not, you know, I, I, I want to see more from the Chargers to be able to fully buy in. I have no idea, you know, I'm sorry, Adam, what the Browns are going to look like um, with Deshaun back in the fold. It's just, it's such an interesting situation. I'm not big on Jacksonville, things like that. So I'd go Buffalo or Cincinnati. I think we're all going to forget that Cincinnati kind of exists. Um, again, sorry, Adam. Uh, but, um, I, you know, because the way they bowed out so early with Joe Burrow's injury, I think that they'll kind of be, you know, hiding in plain sight. And on the NFC side of things, I'm I'm really fearful that it's going to be the Packers and that we've just begun a whole new era all over Ooh. again. That's it's just going to be terrifying and, and unfortunate. And so um, I'll I'll say Buffalo, Green Bay, Cincinnati, Green Bay is kind of an honorary you know mention as a second. But um, I just have I have a difficult time believing the Cowboys can plow through all the weird stories that are going to encircle them this season just because of the contract side of things. Yeah. No. Speaking of contracts, um, you know, I was on radio row and had some conversations about contracts and things like this. And certainly, you know, the fully guaranteed contracts, um, you've got the Deshaun Watson situation out there. And then Cleveland has to have four different quarterbacks to uh, get to the playoffs with the guy who came off his mom's couch. Um, where do you think we're going to, what do you think we're going to see here in the future of contracts, especially on quarterbacks based off of, you know, precedents or, you know, for good or for bad? I think that that ultimately is maybe up to the Super Bowl MVP. I mean, I, I think Patrick Mahomes has the chance to probably, you know, be the first to command a percentage of the salary cap. I know that that's obviously territory that, that NFL teams don't want to come close towards, but Mahomes was, was pretty amicable with the Chiefs the first time around uh, when he did his deal. And and obviously it's only aged well. And I, I just, I mean, I remember when Matt Ryan – got to 30 million a year and that was just like the dumbest thing possible that that, that could that, that a quarterback could, and that was seven years ago yeah. uh and so the idea that you know Dak or whoever it is could could almost hit 60 this offseason is absurd I mean we we just had quarterbacks hitting 50 million dollars a year and so uh the number continues to grow and it continues to sound absurd and people continue to kind of lean on the number but from a percentage standpoint it's the same I mean this is the most popular sport in the world outside of you know soccer which is understandable and over 100 million people watch the Super Bowl and so the salary cap will continue to grow and soon enough I mean I wouldn't doubt it if in two three years we're talking about quarterbacks making 75 80 million dollars a year I mean the Cowboys are going to have to hand out deals in all likelihood to Dak, CD, and Micah this offseason that are probably going to, from an annual average value perspective, take over $100 million per year, which is pretty wild. But the salary cap can contain that, and that's just kind of par for the course in that sense. Absolutely. No, well said. And, you know, the brand is really growing around the world. I love the shot. I don't know if you saw it in the Super Bowl last night of, you know, people in Munich, Germany and people in Mexico and people in there's a couple other countries listed there. But, uh, you know, just supporting the team. Right. Uh, focusing in on, you know, this great American sport 
sport that's becoming right worldwide and global. And I love what the NFL is also doing with their international program. I remember back whenever we were playing, we had a couple of guys um, who came in who were from you know Germany and Estonia and Africa and guys who you know just didn't have this outlet right to be able to um, you know carve their path right. So the NFL is really going global, and you know. Like you said, I think it's only the grant, the brand is only growing bigger and people are going to see, you know, more and more dollars kind of continue to being pumped into the space. And to do that, you got to pay the quarterbacks more. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, the accessibility to the yeah. NFL continues to grow, obviously. Um, and I know that people have passionate thoughts on this, that or the other. But um, it, it feels like there's an NFL game on in every time slot you know, on every day, kind of around the holidays. Um, I would say around Black Friday, you know, I'm obsessed with the NFL, but I almost felt just the teeniest bit of NFL fatigue. It just kind of felt like, you know, like it, it wouldn't hurt to watch, you know, Jingle All the Way with my my family right now. You know what I mean? You guys are just, you know, taking up a little bit too much of my time. Um, but that being said, I mean, you know, obviously with streaming entering the conversation more and more and, and, and gambling money coming in, um, it's exciting. As somebody who's who's loved the NFL forever and who's you know been obsessed with it, it is so cool to see um, it just become this this bigger and bigger and bigger thing uh, with with more ways to understand it. That's again to come kind of come back to the main point why I'm such a fan of you all because it's one thing to just say oh the four quarters are played or and we had overtime and that was cool, but like you know we've seen that before. We've seen you know teams in the Super Bowl before, but to contextualize it different ways and to understand like. No, you don't understand like new, you know, there was a new frontier that was crossed, you know, in this game or in this moment or, or by this player or in this season. Um, those are those are the new things that I, I think kind of keep our flames lit all the way through as football fans. No, great point. I mean, look, you know, the shield has evolved so much even over the last five years and what we're seeing from, you know, there is no NFL offseason when you look at the Super Bowl ends. You go right into getting ready for the combine and then it's the draft and the combine and the draft are now all these elaborate events um, and the coverage is impressive. Um, they have done a nice job of in bringing in the fans. Um, it is it is pretty neat. And to your point, Hale, too, you know, the uh, the commercials and you know, we didn't talk about our favorite commercial from last night, but one of them certainly was the international um, with the young boy playing, you know, imaginary football and dodging things we've all done growing up in our backyards and takes at the five touchdown. And uh, they did a cool job with that, you know, the African in integration there. Um, so we're doing good things. I know we're not going to keep you much longer, but I got to bring up one subject, RJ, for, you know, our listeners out there. We love this game, but the game's not perfect. The players aren't perfect. Um, and so, you know, Travis Kelsey over the last course of the year, we've seen him throw his helmet down Really, really hard. We saw Mahomes behave, maybe not the way that we wanted him to behave when they um, they played uh, Buffalo. And then last night, you see Travis Kelsey almost body check Andy Reid and get up in his face, right? And so, you know, being a father, being an athlete, and you know, watching with my kids and wanting to see sportsmanship, you see this sort of thing happen. And back in the day, somebody might get benched, but that's not how the world works anymore when money's on the line and championships. Uh, and the team, it's about the team, yet there are lessons that can be learned. But I haven't seen any sort of readouts. But from, from covering the game like you do, what are thoughts about the, the actions of these players that many might call a hero? I won't call them a hero. But those that look up to these guys, and especially younger kids, you know, what, what are we seeing and or what do you think needs to happen? I mean, that's such a slippery slope. And I think um, obviously the, the more recent example is, is Travis, you know, speaking to, to Andy Reid and, you know, from their accounts after the game. And, you know, I think the accounts are a little bit more soft given that they won the game uh, as opposed to potentially if they lost, maybe maybe it's viewed through a more contentious lens or contentious lens. Um, but I mean, I think we're all willing to understand that there it's it's a heat of the moment thing. It's a heat of passion. It's, a you know, there's life and legacies and history and, and money on the line and all sorts of things. And so um, it seemed kind of, you know, normal. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a poor way, but we've seen obviously clips of Travis Kelsey or Mahomes, you know, getting emotional before. Um, I do think, I, I think that in general, football fans have a great sense of, of accountability that they'll hold people to. Um, you mentioned the Buffalo game that felt um, that felt like the moment that everybody kind of, you know, kind of checked the Chiefs and said, okay, guys, you guys being you know, a little bit ridiculous here, especially because their whole defense of everything was, well, how can you get rid you know, how can you call back this play? It was so cool. You know, that was just a, a, a ridiculous kind of defense. I mean, um, and so I, I think to answer the question more fully, the 
the only real Cowboys example I can think of, I don't know if, if either of you remember, but after they were bounced by the 49ers in the wild card round after the 2021 season, the, the game played at AT&T Stadium, the Jimmy Garoppolo Niners, um, Cowboys fans threw, you know, beer bottles and stuff on, on the field at refs and stuff mm-hmm. like that and uh, felt like the game wasn't officiated properly. And obviously officiating is, a, is an issue that people have with the game. But um, after the game, C.D. Lamb and Demarcus Lawrence, they blamed officials. And every Cowboys fan thought that that was just really lame and uncool and, you know, not what you want to see your your favorite players do. And, um, and Dak Prescott, who is the most buttoned up dude, I mean, you will find. And I would I would challenge you to find somebody who uh, who speaks the company line and, and who doesn't stray away from it as, as often as Dak or as infrequently as Dak. Um, Dak was asked about that in his post game press conference and, and very clearly let the moment just kind of get to him, unfortunately, and said, good, you know, I'm glad they threw it. And it was just, again, it, you know, Dak is a divisive figure. So I don't mean to act like Cowboys fans have his back entirely because that's just the way the Cowboys are. Uh, but everybody, even his most ardent supporters felt like, you know what, dude, relax. I mean, I know you lost this playoff game and that's really frustrating and that's really unfortunate, but let's not advocate, you know, violence. Let's not advocate being silly. And so in my experience, um, people tend to be pretty fair with this kind of stuff. And, and based on my own personal Twitter timeline, I haven't seen anybody too upset at Travis Kelsey. Um, I think everybody's just, you know, from the understanding that, you know, he wanted to be involved and it was a close game and thankfully they won it. Yeah. Sometimes all is uh, forgiven when you win. Right. But, uh, History we'll, is, we'll, is written by the winners. That's um, that's the way it goes. Um. RJ, really appreciate your time today. This was a fun conversation. Appreciate the insights from the Super Bowl to what's going on with the boys in Cowboy Nation. Uh, before we let you go, um, for those that want to would love to follow you on your various handles, uh, how can they find you? Sure. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at RJ Ochoa, and those just kind of serve as hubs uh, for everything that I do. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's a it's an amazing life that I get to live. I'm inordinately blessed to get to talk about this for a living and uh, be able to work from home and um, and do that and, and just kind of have have a job that that I you know that doesn't feel like work to me. Um, and it's aided by people like you all um, who just provide information to help me sound and seem a little bit smarter than I really am. Uh, and so again, I know I've thanked you all uh, a lot, but but you know it's it's not enough. Again, this is. Uh, this is a really fascinating time to enjoy sports. I, I mean, I'm a big baseball fan, and the data in that sport is just – that's actually overwhelming. I don't, I can't process um, everything that's available in Major League Baseball. But uh, but you all do such a wonderful job, and, and I don't think it gets seen or noticed as much. And so I'm very happy that you all have outlets like your newsletter and very happy to, in my own small way, help shine a light upon it, hopefully – um, and, and provide people with perspective on, on who's really doing the work for things like this. And so I'm, I'm genuinely and, and generally in awe of you and your team. And so uh, thank you for, uh, for making this season a really fun one from an informational standpoint. I'm looking forward to the future. Outstanding. Excellent. I want to thank Christian Blattner for connecting us with you and uh, getting you on the show today. Um, I think, hell, absolutely. Um, RJ, we're going to have to get together mid-season next year and uh, get a check-in on the first half of the season. And as we look forward to the second half of the future, and we're going to talk some serious Cowboys, which, by the way, which our which our, our listeners will love to hear, is, and as you likely know, is that the, the Dallas Cowboys are also a practice client of Zebra, where we have our RTLS, UWB, RFID system, tracking the indoor and the outdoor practice facility so that the Cowboys data scientists can, um, can look at all of that various data and do the appropriate schema uh, to get them um, winning each and, and ready for each and every game. You, you say that, and I, you know, I'm still a little bit upset at the Cowboys, but I will defend Mike McCarthy on this. Um, he is people hear the t- terms like players coach. Um, he he studies that, and he is well aware of his players and how hard they are working, and how frequently or infrequently they are working. And uh, there's a, I mean, obviously, you know, they've had injuries and things like that, but there's a reason the Cowboys have had the success that they have had. Um, over the last three years under his leadership and under his guidance. And a big reason for that is his understanding of when he can and when he needs to push them and give them rest. Um, things that, to your point, would not be understood or, or able to be as digested as efficiently, if not for your information. Well, that's awesome to hear. You know, we used to say there's two types of coaches and GMs out there. Those that embrace data, data analytics, and then there's former coaches and GMs. That's really so, well said. <laughs> it, it's the only way it's trending. It is a tool for the toolbox. Uh, but certainly, I think we, what we have seen and what you're seeing in the NFL is that 
you know, when you when you scrutinize and you find what's important out of the data, it can make an it can make a difference and an impact. There's a reason um, that the most highly successful people in any walk of life um, think and operate this way. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I know it's a, a bit of a slow roll for some generations to accept, but this, I wouldn't even say this is the future. This, and it's not even the present, this is the past. Um, and so if you, if you haven't adjusted to it, I mean, good luck and uh, enjoy, yeah. um, enjoy the ride, I suppose. Well said. And again, uh, thanks for being on the show. Hale, why don't you uh, take us out? Yeah, absolutely. Well, RJ, again, thank you so much for uh, taking some time to speak to Zebra Nation. You know, we really appreciate your thoughts and your insight. Great, great information about what you're doing and how you're using our data on a daily basis to you know inform your, your Dallas Cowboys listeners. So um, thank you so much. And uh, um, I'm Hale Hentges. And I'm Adam Petrus. And this, this is it for this uh, podcast. We're signing off. Talk to you guys next time. Cheers.